All right, and our second speaker of the session is Mike Walmsley, here to talk about the Galaxy Zoo, which I've heard of uh, a few years ago, so it's going to be exciting to hear about it again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so take it away. Nice, thank you. I'm glad you've heard of it. My apologies to the um, conference participants from the last few weeks who have also definitely heard of it, because I've been in sales pitch mode. Um, my name is Mike Walmsley. I'm the lead data scientist for Galaxy Zoo. And in this talk, I want to kind of tell you guys about how we're trying to evolve Galaxy Zoo into a world which also has all of the capable data science tools that you guys have all produced. Like, what is the role for volunteers in doing useful science in a world where we also have those classifiers? Um, just very briefly, because, I mean, shout out to Paco for being like, why do we need, what's, what's morphology for again? Here's the what's morphology for slide. Um, John already introduced, I thought, quite nicely kind of the, the extra information you get in a picture. So just to really hammer that home, you know, these will have some spectra, these will have some photometric measurements, but there's information in these pictures over and above what you can write down in a table. And the goal of Galaxy Zero and really the goal of morphology in general is to describe galaxies to capture that information and use it to explain the astrophysics of what's going on. So that's the short answer. And, and these galaxies, can I have a pointer? No. Oh. Interesting. There we go. So these galaxies are from not just random galaxies, they're selected by the Galaxy Zoo volunteers as being interesting, anomalous, perhaps even beautiful for targeted HST observations. So there's also, and a big focus of this talk is going to be um, anomaly hunting, how we can use that kind of unique ability of people to look at a picture and say, hmm, that's a little bit weird. We're going to have a lot of pictures. So Terry has teed me up very nicely for new data sets. Uh, so this is the size of the Galaxy Zoo data releases to date. Uh, this is what it's going to look like when we release Galaxy Zoo DESI, which is finished and kind of on my cluster uh, and took a lot of work, took about seven years, plus a lot of machine learning. Uh, and this is Euclid. <laughs> So, you know, we live in interesting times, and the challenge is going to be either we will have the largest, richest catalog of morphology measurements to date, or we won't, because we won't be able to keep up. Um, and that's my job, that's our job. Um, we've been building machine learning systems, of course, to learn from the volunteers, to predict what they would say, to scale things up for Euclid. I showed this demo to the other conference participants. Uh, this is the uh, selection of galaxies from Galaxy Zoo decals. When I showed them, I went for a certain set of sliders to filter those, so I'm going to have to pick a different set of sliders this time. So let's pick galaxies with spiral arms. Oh, the internet's too slow. Okay, fine. My live demo's failing. That's never happened before. I've given, you know how many times I've shown this demo? Like, Thousands, yeah, that's live demos. Let's try it again. There we go. Let's pick galaxies with three spiral arms. There we go. So we can filter the galaxies by these quite detailed measurements. Anything which we ask you in Galaxy Zoo, we've trained models to predict accurately, and we can then scale to the rest of the data set. So that gives us very fine grained. We're not talking about like elliptical versus spiral here. We can really drill into the detailed morphology. So as kind of a structure, uh, I've already talked a little bit about how we train effective models, right? Given a set of volunteer labels, how do we, what is the right task to solve in a supervised sense, and how do we do that well? Uh, then, given we can do that, how do we, uh, the limiting factor is for how many surveys Galaxy Zoo can do, um, how many labels do we need to train those accurate classifiers then? We don't need people to look at everything, we need people to look at enough things that we can train good classifiers and then scale the rest. So how do we do that with as few labels as possible so we can do as many surveys as possible? Um, and then lastly, I'm going to talk about how we essentially put Galaxy Zoo kind of on your laptop, how you can leverage the models we're training to solve new tasks which are totally different to the tasks that we're already learned to do. Um, so briefly, the big key to training effective Galaxy Zoo models is recognizing the uncertainty and leaning into it. So 
when we ask people questions, we might have, say, you know, 40 people at the top of the tree, smooth or featured, but we don't control how many people get down to each leaf. There might be, say, two people who answered, you know, how many spiral arms are there. So that means our labels have this massive uncertainty, um, particularly some are massively uncertain and some are massively confident. Um, so to deal with that, we, we build probabilistic models. They have a custom loss function that accounts for predicting kind of the, the, that particular coin toss uncertainty. And we also just kind of marginalize over many models. So um, like Soteria showed with the random seed, it really, different instances of an ensemble will just have different predictions. Um, so not only do we have dropout in our models to kind of add some variation on a per model basis, we, do, we just train large ensembles. And that turns out to be really important for calibration. So the consequence of this, and that's what these figures on the side are showing. So each of these curves is a different model. Um, predicting how many spiral, how many people of n might say spiral arms, um, and our final kind of published posteriors that the catalog are based on are are these kind of average posteriors over many models where each model is itself doing dropout. And we find these are now well calibrated. Having gone to the trouble of getting posteriors, though, we can start to do some fun stuff. So Satira and I did not plan our talks together, but we've also got active learning for morphology, but in quite a different sense. Um, so we can ask the question, if we want to train a model to answer any galaxy zoo question as well as we can, which galaxies should we show the volunteers, right? Most, most galaxies are not visually that exciting. Some of them are dramatic and complicated and challenging for models. So the model should be able to say, I need you to go label that galaxy. This one I've got. Um, and if, and, and a, a good criteria for this, by the way, is looking at where those different models in the ensembles confidently disagree. And you can show kind of from first principle information theory, if you look at the mutual information between the labels and then what they would constrain about the model parameters, that this is a theoretically excellent query criteria. For smooth galaxies versus featured galaxies, unsurprisingly, the informative galaxies are the more featured and interesting and tricky ones. And it's, you know, if I just show here the, the typical distributions in the data set, um, on, on, by random, the, the overall distribution, most things are smooth. But once we apply active learning, we really flatten that out and even prefer you know, featured things somewhat because of this query function. Here is if we're trying to optimize to answer the question, does this galaxy have a bar? Can anybody see the difference between these two halves? Resolution, yes, exactly right. So in the center, you can see that there's a bar or not. Well, for these ones, it's just kind of blurry in the middle, like you can't really tell. Um, resolution here, really, 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 we mean redshift, right? These are things which are closer or further away. So nice, well done. Um, so having trained effective models, having chosen which galaxies to label, now we want to say, well, how many surveys can we do this for, right? Can we now, we've done it for decals, it took us five years. Can we do it for hypersupreme camp in three months, six months? Can we do it for Euclid? Can we do it for Roman? Can we do it for Ruben? Like um, the, the scale of the instrumentation is going so fast that we want to be able to really push down to say, well, give me you know, six months of volunteer time and we can classify everything in an arbitrarily large survey with those images. That's the goal. Um, one of the tricks we do to do that is we use self-supervised learning. So this is uh, my colleague Inigo Val. Um, he is applying a technique called um, uh, build your own latent, BYOL. Uh, and here we're trying to classify, these are radio images. Manchester is very into radio. Um, radio astronomers often distinguish between Farinoff Riley type 1 and type 2 galaxies, which is a statement about the, the visual orientation of the, the jets and where the brightness in those jets is, where the flux is. Um, BYOL essentially takes these two pictures, um, passes them through two networks, and has one network predict what the other one would have as an internal representation. And so it can learn an unsupervised way to distinguish these images, and you can apply whatever transforms you like to insert some invariant, say, to rotation. And when you add this pre-training step and you then try to solve the supervised task, right? So we're not just doing this. We then say, okay, we've, we've developed a, a pre-trained representation. Now actually go find those FR1, FR2s in some much smaller labeled subset. We actually only have, there are like a few thousand of these known, like in total. We have like a competent set of like 700. 
Um, but when we do the pre-training, we can improve the accuracy on that final supervised task by about 50%. So 12.5% error to 7% error. And I already talked about this, so I won't go into it too much for the conference people, but just to say we can, we can add in the supervised task kind of as part of the same process. So this is, again, the BOL framework. What we can do, if you notice, this is like a normal CNN. This is a normal CNN. We can add another head on top and solve the supervised task as well. So we're solving the, the contrastive learning, you know, predict the representation, and we're solving the supervised task at the same time. Uh, and this does even better. So here we're trying to find ring galaxies. Um, this is how many labeled rings we have. This is how well we do. Um, this is training from scratch. You can see it's kind of impossible below a thousand or so. Um, but if we do this kind of joint supervised, self-supervised pre-training, we can do well with of order thousands to, to 10,000 labels, right? Which really starts to make things possible at the scale of any survey because almost anybody could gather, you know, look at 10,000 images if you really had to, or you have a grad student. Um, we already use this for science. So for, the, so for the rings, for example, one thing we can find, having gone out and found, we found something like 30,000 rings in the DESI surveys, which is about six times more than anybody found you know, in total up till now. Um, we find that rings which are in non-spiral galaxies, uh, the colors aren't great, but they're these green dots up here. In the, perfect, yes, look over there. The green dots that are up here in the red sequence, these are non-spiral rings. The spiral rings are in the green valley. So it, the morphology is really changing the nature of star formation in these galaxies. Lastly, and really the part that I'm most excited about, if we can train good models, and we can train them without using too many labels, what then do we do with those models beyond Galaxy Zoo? And that's really what this part is about. So let me show you a new demo. This one I've never done before in a talk, so it could be even more fun. Um, so here is uh, the latent space, the internal representation learned by uh, Galaxy Zoo's latest models that have been trained on all of our labeled galaxies to date. So something like 100 million human labels. And I'm applying it, I'm calculating the same representations for all the DESI galaxies, all the featured ones. And I can click around and explore. Um, and what you'll notice is that these are what Josh might call weekly modal. If we cluster here, there are kind of distinct visual groups of, of similar galaxies with similar morphologies. And then there are kind of troughs between them. So many of these sort of subpopulations are, I think, very scientifically interesting. So if I click here, for example, we can pull out all the galaxies which have what you might call um, highly bright streams, or sort of they've had recent, you know, not quite dwarf interactions, but interactions with some, so these are massive galaxies with some not quite as massive partner, leaving some trace. So I think that relates a lot to um, uh, Martin's work. To, and if we click in other spots, we can find, for example, Dwarf galaxies, these you'll notice have largely cores. If I click across, we can also find what you might call more, much more regular dwarfs. And this is kind of interesting to me because dwarf is not a question in Galaxy Zoo. Like we don't ask volunteers, is this a dwarf? It's just visually different. And once you learn to answer you know, the 200 or so questions we've ever asked people, it becomes easy to generalize to new questions. Um, another one to show up here is rings, so we can find ring galaxies, and we can find ring galaxies with bars in the middle. Again, ring is not a question we ask galaxies who volunteers, it's a question which falls out of the latent space that we're learning. You can imagine, and I'll kind of leave it to you guys to fill in, um, how you could build lots and lots of tools on top of this, right? You can build a, a similarity search, right? Instead of just clicking the latent space, you could say, show me all the things which have a representation close to this galaxy. You can build an anomaly finder, right? Which you can say, well, there are some areas in this representation which I'm particularly interested in. You know, show me more galaxies from here, or you could build 
um, like a query strategy, like, oh, this was interesting, rate it highly, that was not interesting, rate it low. Now, where am I uncertain about where my interest lies? Give me more of those things. Now, both of these are tools that we're building at the Zooniverse. So pretty soon on Galaxy Zoo, you'll be able to say, you know, here is a Galaxy Zoo picture, show me more galaxies like this. Um, here is a Galaxy Zoo picture, here's another one, this is your interest. We've learned from you the things you're interested in, and we're going to show you more of those. From a sort of academic researcher side in terms of code, the obvious benefit, I think, for, for other people is that you can adapt that representation to answer your own morphology tasks. So because we have similar galaxies in similar places, it's very easy to fine tune to new tasks. And that's how, that's why this is good at finding rings, because they already start off in a similar place, right? I didn't show you, we've got mergers and all sorts of stuff in here as well. Um, so for fine tuning to find mergers, um, David Orion used the uh, ESA Data Labs uh, new project, which is sort of like Jupyter Notebooks next to the Hubble archive and soon the Euclid archive uh, to find, to fine tune, to find mergers. Uh, Kiwaki Amori used this to find um, mergers and title features in Hypersuprime Cam. Uh, Prab Bamber at UCL used this to measure the length of bars. So uh, you can use saliency techniques like GradCam and such to look at where the, which pixels the network is paying attention to. And you can then kind of post process out, you know, where then might the bar be, right? Where, where is the network looking? Well, that must be where the bar is. Um, and if you add in the Zoobook pre-training, this works much better. You can also use this to do uh, object detection. So if you take, um, we had hundreds of thousands of people label um, galaxies and SDSS for clumps, particularly interested in understanding you know, how star formation changes over cosmic time. Now we want to apply that to hypersuprime can much deeper and such. So if you pre-train uh, using Zubot and then use that encoder in your object detection framework, like faster RCNN, you can do a much better job of pulling out those clumps on your new survey. So this is a work in progress. And you guys can give it a try. So sales pitch moment. This is all the code you need to fine tune it. Um, you can hop on the, the GitHub link and check it out, but essentially import, load your data set, tell PyTorch how to load it. We have a pre-built utility for that. Import the model, fine tune. And I've worked really hard on trying to make this as easy as possible. I think kind of sociologically, we spend a really long time as astronomers, particularly as grad students who are like all kind of into ML, right? This is an ML friendly crowd, like making our own models from scratch, which I think is fine, but it's not necessarily the best use of our time because I don't know how many people in this room have like coded up a PyTorch CNN and applied it to solve some classification task on some images and baffled like how to load fits files or like I only have a thousand labels. Why doesn't it work very well? How do I regularize it and so on? So. This is my kind of effort to give people a good framework to do that, to kind of save time, and also to build models which work better because they've been pre-trained on so much. And I think that's kind of the other half to the, I mean, the AI revolution we talk about a lot is, is very like, you know, big models, big parameters, but the other part of that triangle is big data, right? They're just already seeing so many things and already learned to solve such a broad task for like chat GPT, predict the next word is, kind of the broadest task you could imagine if it's code or poetry or um, a video game map, right? This is kind of the analogy. Um, so that's the stuff that I've been working on, trying to move Galaxy Zoo from giving catalogs to people where we've kind of done our best to work out, this is what we think you might need. Please, you know, be, hope it's useful to, here is the tools and the pre-trained models that you can adapt to answer the questions in your surveys for finding dwarfs, for finding streams, for finding rings, for finding whatever it is you want, for you know, using morphology to estimate some physical parameters, gas masses, metallicities. Like this is supposed to give everybody a starting point to do that and leverage our volunteers. So ultimately the volunteers will help you get more science done. Thanks for your time. Um, so, Jyotakure, ah, wonderful. Um, so, I guess this relates to Zubot as well, but let's say you have models trained on SDSS or HST, and now you want to plug that into some other survey. How applicable are those models? Yeah, so we actually train on all the surveys at once. 
that we have. So we train on SDSS, we train on um, Hubble, the candles and GZ Hubble data sets. We train on Hyper Prime Cam and we train on DESI. And it's all the same model predicting all of those at the same time. That's, that's the core idea of trying to make the task as broad as possible. And so we hope that if it can do a good job predicting on all of those surveys, you know, N plus one survey should still be reasonable. Of course, it's always an empirical question. I mean, you know, sales pitch mode aside, you do have to try it and see. And if the surveys are wildly different, it is not going to work. Um, but it should be a good starting point. Hey, I have the mic so I can continue. Here. Ah. Uh, thanks. How do you deal in the Zooniverse, so Galaxy Zoo, with the sizes and resolution? So you can have galaxies that are similar in practice, but you see them at different distances, so there will be different sizes, mm. and so the, the, your uh, uh, volunteers will, will see different things. Will they end up in, in your latent space? Will galaxies are in, in practice similar, but at different yeah. distances appear in completely different areas? Um, they won't, because we, by construction, resize the thumbnails such that the galaxies always look visually to the volunteers about the same size, um, because they need to be able to see the morphology. So if you just leave them the same physical size in the picture, then they're just, you know, some of them are just going to be dots. Um, I think if you're interested in the size relation, the best thing would be to add that information, you know, as another column in your latent space afterwards. Like we're astronomers, if there's one thing we can do well, it's putting ellipses around objects. So we can measure sizes moderately can well. We can add that ourselves. Thanks. Um, this is Louise Edwards. Thanks so much, Mike. This is um, amazing. Um, can okay in the um, where you have the latent space and you can click around to see the different classes. Uh, what does it look like when there's a dip and there's hardly anything in there? Those are rare things. Those are well. It's a little bit hard to say definitively. Let's have a look, shall we? Thank you. Um, so if we click a dip, you find the galaxies in it tend to look somewhat, it depends exactly where you click really. So, so there are so many galaxies in here, this is about 600,000 galaxies, but what visually looks like a dip is still quite a lot of galaxies at any one point. And hence the similarity search still works reasonably well. I just click kind of randomly in that gap and these are kind of diffuse -ish edge on disks with a little, not really much spiral structure, one of them, yeah. So it's still very visually similar. Um, that's, so it's not to say there are no galaxies in the dips, but I think it's just to say that in this particular 2D visualization of this particular latent space, there are a much lower density of examples of galaxies. So this is the opposite of a mode as appears you know, in this particular compression. It's probably worth saying that this is actually you know, a 1,280 dimension vector when it comes out. When you PCA it down, it's like 30 odd you know, 99% variance. So this is a slightly misleading view of what density might look like, but it's kind of a best effort. And I think it'll be really fun to look at how we cluster this to work out what those modes, what those visual modes are in a data-driven way. Uh, hi, Mike. Yeah, really nice. Toby Brown. Um, I'm thinking kind of like the Father Ted problem, like mm. small versus far away. Mm. Like how, how does the machine pick out like in this space, exactly, you could see a thing where you click on a, a mode or a density peak and it's like dwarfs and far away galaxies. Yeah. How do, does it do this or? Um, yes, so it's all, often useful to make a distinction between sort of apparent and intrinsic morphology, absolute morphology if you like, um, where what's in the picture is of course through our observational difficulty, right? And, we, and often what astronomers want is, so what is the galaxy after all? And that is not a question which machine learning will solve for you, not, not, not in this sort of stage process, right? Where we, we shouldn't expect our models to tell us information which is not in the images. So if, the, you know, we take a spiral galaxy, put it far away, put it from an ML classifier and it says it's not a spiral, that's the correct answer to me because that's what we actually measure and it's telling us that back. I think if you want to there are different, there are lots of people who work hard on trying to reverse this effect. People do like super resolution, people do like, you know, take low redshift stuff, high redshift to predict the low redshift label. Um, I think these are statistically tricky because it's very hard to get the PDF of things you would expect back correct, right? It's yeah. almost like the mode collapse in GANs kind of a problem. 
Um, at Galaxy Zoo, what we do now is we use the fact that we can run these classifiers to say, okay, let's take a fixed train classifier, take the low redshift object, simulate them at higher redshift, watch how the classification changes, and then from that, we can calibrate out what might it reasonably be with a full uncertainty. But the latent space won't reflect that. This is a later step. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is Pablo from Montreal. Um, yeah, I'm very curious about the, the so you mentioned you did um, weight marginalization with dropout. Um, but now there are much more kind of mm. sophisticated tools like stochastic weight averaging and stuff. Have you checked if those kind of improve your performance? Um, yeah. Um, so I found the drop. So indeed, I mean, I found the dropout doesn't doesn't actually help very much, really. I think it it's very 2016, right, in the machine learning world. Um, it's not a good it's not a good approximation to training new models. It's an unboundedly bad one, technically, right? Um, ensembling works really well and is very easy. At the scale of Astro data, you know, I have a few A100s, I can crank one of these models in an hour on one of them, you know. The easiest way to marginalize over it is just to marginalize over it by training more of them. And so that's been the brute force approach we took. Um, there's a student in my office, Davina Mohan, who's working on uh, stochastic gradient MCMC, um, SVI, to work on, you know, single model Bayesian deep learning, particularly for the radio galaxy stuff. Um, that does seem to work very well. Um, it's just tricky to get right, and it's tricky to add in. There's a kind of a, a complexity overhead to getting it right, which means you have to sacrifice. For example, it's not so obvious how I plug that in with the BYOL stuff, right? So for me, I'm sticking with ensembles for now as a kind of a brute hammer, and I'll let the computer scientists, you know, continue the single model cleverness. There you go. Yeah. Josh Peak here, as always. Um, so this, I love this stuff so deeply and much. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, Dovey says that the, the um, latent space of these galaxies has no new information in it. We have looked at this latent space through the last 30 years, at least since Sloan, um, and figured out how all these things are related. Can we disprove him? Hmm. Will anyone look at this latent space? Anyone who has, will Risa Wexler look at this latent space and tell me, <laughs> yep, I know why that's there, I know why that's there, this is somebody or other, you know, 2011, this is somebody or other, 2015, this relationship is somebody, somebody, <laughs> like, right, like, do we know everything in this latent space? How are we ever gonna know if we know everything in this latent space? Or do we have to do what Dovey does and Dahlia does and just look at the outliers and say, these wacky things are actually what, how we're gonna learn new stuff? Mm. Do you have an answer to my question? Mm. I will ask. I always love this challenging vibe, Josh. That's, that's, that's my jam. Really I love this so, 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 so much. Um, I will quote you from a few days ago, <laughs> who was quoting David Hogg and said, search can be unprincipled. I think the, uh, the purpose of the latent space is to make an unprincipled search to say, visually, morphologically, what kind of galaxies are there? That isn't going to tell us any astrophysics in of itself. It's certainly not going to constrain, you know, omega matter. It won't tell us, you know, there are this many dwarfs, so we understand, you know, small, small scale structure formation. Um, but it might tell us these are the kinds of subpopulations that we might want to tinker with, right? If we say these are the galaxies which have, you know, bright streams around them, and there are, now we can really, you know, fine tune to go and find those bright streams and say, well, there are, you know, a hundred galaxies with bright streams out of the 300 featured things, and that tells us something about the frequency of you know, moderately sized mergers in the local universe. Right? So I think that that kind of exploration is what this enables. It's not meant to answer the latent space itself isn't meant to answer that. So let me sharpen my question slightly because I think you're absolutely right. And I guess what I want to say is, how do we get the community to use your latent space for hypothesis generation? to generate new hypotheses. To test hypotheses, we use Bayes. Mm. To generate hypotheses, we look at all the data. We can no longer look at all the data. How do we use, how do we get you to look at the latent space in a way that is principled, I mean, not principled necessarily, but at least like not rediscovering a paper from 2003, but how do we do that? I mean, I realize this is an impossible question, mm. but I'm asking you and the community. Well, I give talks and pitch it very hard. Okay. That's step one. 
Um, <laughs> I actually don't think we need the community. Like, what is the community? Like, we don't need everyone to like <laughs> settle down and be like, this is the latent space, right? Like, the whole point of this is that like we're going away from like this is the Hubble tuning fork. This is how galaxies lie, and then everyone, you know, hundred years ish later is like, wait, there are more kinds of galaxies than this. You know, when we have JWST instead of like Hubble, right? Um, I think. The trick, it's okay, we all have different latent spaces and do different unprincipled search and find different things, and this is a cool subpopulation. Um, I think what I would do want people to do, though, is to stop building every machine learning search from scratch every time. I think that it just isn't, I mean, it's not necessarily a good use of people's time, and I think we can do it better if we work together on it. Maybe this isn't the thing, maybe this isn't like the, the core that that will ultimately be, but like as a sociological statement, I would rather people all had their own latent space and exploration, but then like came together to build generalizable tools for, for doing the detailed search after that. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm so sorry, Sabrina. Um, so let's thank our speakers again, and please uh, pass it down for questions uh, over coffee.